Yes, Mr Costello. <coughs> Commissioner, the next case study in the group life part of this module involves AMP. The witness is Mr Sainsbury. Could I trouble you to stand a moment and could I ask you whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? An oath, Commissioner. Swear the witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Yes, thank you, Mr. Holler. Is your full name Paul John Sainsbury? Yes. And is your current business address Mr. Sainsbury, 33 Alfred Street, Sydney? Yes. And is your current position Group Executive, Wealth Solutions and Customer for AMP Group? Yes. And have you received a summons to appear at this round of hearings uh, of the Commission? Yes. Do you have the summons with you? I do. Ten of the summons. Exhibit 6.232, the summons to Mr Sainsbury. Thank you, Mr Commissioner. And Mr Sainsbury, you've prepared two witness statements for the purposes of these hearings? That's right. Um, and you've prepared a witness statement which addresses uh, the topics and questions in rubric 630 and 631. Is that correct? That's right. And is that statement dated 10 September 2018? Yes, it is. And do you have that statement with you? I do. Are the contents of that statement true and correct, Mr Sainsbury? They are. Um, I tender that statement and its exhibit, Mr Commissioner. That statement and its exhibits becomes exhibit 6.233. And you've also prepared another witness statement, haven't you? Yes, I have. And that, that statement addresses certain topics and questions specified in rubric 669. That's right. Um, is that statement dated 5 September 2018? Yes, it is. And do you have that statement with you? I do. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. And uh, I tender that statement uh, and its exhibit. Mr. That Mr. statement and its exhibits become exhibit 6.234. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hollow. Yes, Mr. Costello. Mr. Sainsbury, AMP has two RSE licensees, AMP Superannuation Limited and National Mutual Superannuation Limited. That's right. And you're the Group Executive Wealth Solutions and Customer? That's right. To who do you, whom do you report? I report to the CEO. And what's your role in connection with superannuation? So I provide um, many of the administrative functions on behalf of the trustee around product, product selection, product management, and including strategic marketing related functions. AMP also has a trustee services unit. Yes, it does. And that unit's independent of the business? Yes, it is. You're not independent of the business? No, I'm an agent of the trustee in my role. And you are relevantly the business? Yes. Thank you. Um, for present purposes, we're concerned with insurance in superannuation. Do you agree that it is important for superannuation trustees to act in the interests of their members in connection with group life policies? Yes, I do. And on occasion, that may include... Yes. AMP Life is another wholly owned subsidiary of AMP? It is. And it's the group life insurer for most members who have superannuation with AMP? That's right. You explain in your one of your statements that AMP Life is also the administrator of AMP Superannuation Limited's funds? That's right and it is also the administrator of some of National Mutual Superannuation Limited's funds. That's right. Could you explain in general terms what the role of an administrator is? The administrator um, creates the products that the trustee makes available to members and ensures that uh, those products are effectively administered on behalf of the members uh, and, and that ongoing servicing related matters are supported uh, for the members of the funds. One of the roles of the administrator is to ensure compliance with Prudential Standard SPS 250? That's right. And you have some familiarity with that standard? Yes. Um, it's a regulatory standard produced by APRA and it has the force of law? Yes. Um, I might just take you briefly to that standard. 
Uh, it is rcd.0021.0020.0020. Say the number again in case I got it wrong. RCD.0021.0020.0020. Thank you. So this is superannuation prudential standard determination number five of 2012, more commonly referred to as SPS 250. Um, and if we just go to uh, Page, the fourth page of that document. It sets out here that the Prudential Standard establishes requirements for an RSE licensee with respect to making insured benefits av available to beneficiaries. And uh, after the larger paragraph, the key requirements of this Prudential Standard are that an RSE licensee must also, and then the second bullet point, formulate and give effect to appropriate selection processes for and due diligence of insurers and monitor relationships with insurers on an ongoing basis. Yes. Are familiar with that? And then if we turn over the page, there's the requirement for an insurance management framework, and you've answered some questions about insurance management frameworks in your statement. Yes. And then if we could um, move to about the seventh page of the document. There's the requirement for the insurance strategy. Yes. And you've also answered some questions about that. And then if we could move across to paragraph 22, please. C22 is the first paragraph beneath the heading selection and monitoring of insurers. Yes. And it requires an RSE licensee to develop a, and implement a selection process for choosing an insurer that includes at a minimum consideration of the prospective insurer's terms of cover and exclusions, claims philosophy, the reasonableness of the premiums to be charged, in terms of any delegation to any other person of functions associated with the making of available insured benefits, undertake a due diligence review of the selected insurer and be able to demonstrate to APRA the appropriateness of the selection process and due diligence review and how it is applied. And then in 23, the licensee must be able to satisfy itself and demonstrate to APRA that the engagement of an insurer is conducted at arm's length and is in the best interest of the beneficiaries. See that? Yes. Is it appropriate for AMP Life, which is the administrator of the funds and the group life insurer, to be tasked with ensuring compliance with those parts of SPS 250? I think um, in relation to the, 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 uh, the matters that you've described, trustee services plays a lead role on behalf of the trustee board in conducting those reviews and ensuring that due diligence processes are followed. You say in paragraph 67 of your 631 witness statement, I can take it to you, take you to it if you like, that AMP Life's responsibilities include undertaking assessments of potential insurers, recommending replacement insurance arrangements and assisting the AMP RSE licensee to negotiate the terms and appointments with the preferred insurer. That's, that's right. Isn't there a clear conflict in AMP Life undertaking that task? The people that perform that task are not associated with the insurance arm of AMP Life. So AMP Life is an administrator in the areas under my responsibility that perform those processes. 
and then they refer them to the trustee for review and approval. You set up some sort of bifurcation within AMP Life so that the people that are making recommendations about whether AMP Life is the appropriate insurer are not connected with the insurance aspect of AMP Life. That's right. And you think that that's an appropriate way to deal with SPS 250's regulatory requirements? Yes, I do. All right. Commissioner, I tender that document. Uh, Prudential Standard, SPS 250 RCD 0021 0020 0001, Exhibit 6.235. How long has AMP Life been the predominant insurer of AMP superannuation funds? Uh, the exact date I couldn't give you, but uh, uh, certainly a very long time. I think the current master outsourcing agreement was put in place in 1995, or at last, last reviewed in 1995. Last reviewed in 1995? I, I believe. I'm not entirely sure about that. Are there ever tenders? I don't, I don't believe so. Thank you. Um, Mr Sainsbury, could you explain the concept of delinking? Most certainly. Uh, a number of the corporate superannuation plans that AMP administers require in their arrangements that upon cessation of employment in a corporate super scheme that the member must be moved to a different product. That term is called delinking. So in simple terms, it's where a person has superannuation through their employer with AMP. They cease working for that employer. They maintain superannuation with AMP, but in a different product. That's right. Thank you. And you're aware that there has been um, some recent examination of default insurance settings in connection with delinked employees? Yes, I am. Thank you. And one of those um, default settings that um, has received some recent consideration is smoker status of the member. Yes. Thank you. Can I take you to a document, please? AMP.6000.0306.2021. This is an email from a financial planner to something called Planner Liaison. Is that a mailbox that you're familiar with? I'm not familiar with it, but it, it would be the location that planners can send in inquiries to, to AMP. Thank you. Um, and this planner has emailed Planner Liaison and says, hello, we have recently become the servicing planner for a particular client. He's been listed as a smoker on his policy. He was unaware that he was listed as a smoker, as it doesn't say this on his annual statements. From meeting with me, we discussed his current position for insurance, and I have informed him that he was listed as a smoker. He was shocked to hear this, as he has never been a smoker when having the policy or within the 12 months prior. He informed me that he last smoked when he was 13 years old at Scouts. The member was delinked from a corporate superannuation client quite a number of years ago and somehow ended up being listed as a smoker. He has around a million dollars of life insurance and was paying $2,600 a month as a smoker before we spoke. We sent the non-smoking statement in a few days ago and his premium has consequently reduced to just over $1,600 per month. The client has a number of AMP policies and ex is extremely unhappy with AMP with the above overcharging, the client requests a revision and refund to the client's account for the overpayments of insurance from the commencement of the policy. Can you please help our client for the above circumstance? So this is an example of a case where somebody has delinked from an AMP superannuation plan. They've remained an AMP member. Yes. They've kept their uh, superannuation with AMP and they have kept life insurance through their AMP superannuation fund. That's right. And they've paid um, an additional loading on their premium because of their smoker status. No, that's not right. All right. Um, tell me what's not right about that. So, um, so when, uh, when members delink from the corporate schemes into 
uh, flexible lifetime super. Uh, the, the terms of that D-Link up until 2006 were that they went into what was called the standard rate. And the standard rate included lives that were both D-Linked members from corporate super schemes. And by that I mean we don't have full understanding of the medical health of the individual. Together with smokers. We don't have full understanding of, you said, we don't have full understanding of, and I then lost the rest oh, of your answer. Sorry, Commissioner. The, uh, the health of the individual uh, and, and smokers are also included in that same standard rate group. Right. It is, in fact, a hybrid rate. Okay. Well, I'll come back to the standard rate in a moment. Um, first, perhaps, Commissioner, could I tender that document? Email financial planner to planner liaison AMP 27. February 2013, AMP 6003060063, Exhibit 6.236. Thank you, Commissioner. Could I now take you to AMP.6000.0306.0069? This is a document generated within AMP after that request had come through from the planner. Um, and it seems to have been prepared by Celeste Semon. Are you aware who Ms Semon worked for? I'm not. Thank you. Um, in any event, it appears that she's done some investigation. And she says, she details the complaint notes that it was a D-linked member. Upon reviewing his plans with his new plan, the client was told he was listed as a smoker. You agree with that much, at least? I, I agree with the way that's described. Thank you. The planner has now requested that we refund the client's previous premiums due to the fact that we do not include the smoker details in the annual statements. Yes. Agree with that? Yes. Um, and you'll see there the date of the D-link was 20th of June. 2005? Yes. And you saw from the email that I've just taken you to that the planner identified this issue in 2013. Yes. So this has gone on for some time. And then you'll see recommendation based on your investigations, the second last row. Whilst I believe that not including the smoker status in our annual statements is unethical, I don't see why we should compensate this member based on his account balance over other members who were requesting the same thing with lower balances and were declined. See that? Yes. Do you have any idea what this document is? Um, well, by, by its definition, it, it, it appears as though it's a request from the advisor through Plan Liaison to, to re reimburse premiums because of a non-smoker status. This is someone within Plan Liaison doing an analysis or making a recommendation to somebody? Uh, somebody. I'm not sure whether it's plan liaison or whether it's in the, the insurance product Thank area. you. And you'll see that the estimate of the rebate in the last cell is $72,000. Yes. But estimate based on a 40% reduction as at the current change on 26 February 2013. So the estimate there is that an additional $72,000 has been paid in premiums between 2005 and the beginning of 2013 as a result of the status. Yes. And um, Ms Semon thought that it was unethical not to include smoker status in the annual statements. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, I don't. Um, unethical for me would imply a, a blatant attempt to cover up uh, something. Um, when, when a member delinks into FLS, the welcome letter that they get on the first page contains an election for non-smoking to enable members to, to, uh, to receive the benefit of that lower premium. And is that structured that way on the assumption that the only time that a person could ever have changed their smoking status is the time that they're delinked? Uh, no, it's, it's structured on the assumption that that is probably the time that is um, superannuation arrangements are most pressing in people's minds when they get that letter. Uh, the annual statements that have issued subsequent to that don't disclose, or at least didn't back in up until 2013, the, uh, the smoker status of, of the individual, but certainly the premiums and the sum insured were shown uh, on the statements throughout that time. Do you accept, accept at a, that at a minimum it would have been better if the annual statements did disclose the smoker status? 
Yes, I do, with the benefit of hindsight. And particularly in circumstances where, as in the case of this member, there was a very significant differential in the premium as a result of it. Do you agree yes. with that? Um, can I tender that document, please, Commissioner? Request for reversal of premium. Have we got a date on it anywhere? We don't. Uh, request for reversal of premium, AMP 6000 0306 0069, exhibit 6.237. Thank you. Could I now take you to AMP.6000.0305.0116, This is the formal letter that responds to the request to refund the differential in the premiums. Um, although it is redacted, the letter is in fact sent to the member, not to the financial advisor. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see that it states there that in the first paragraph, the design of your AMP Custom Super Plan meant that upon ceasing employment with your employer, you're required to exit the plan and an employer guide was provided to you. Then under the next heading, transfer of insurance from Custom Super to AMP Flexible Lifetime Super Plan. So AMP Flexible Lifetime Super Plan is the delinked plan that the member moves to? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, as the insurance formed a part of the plan that you held, while you were employed with your previous employer, this insurance was transferred to your new personal plan when your employment terminated? Automatically? Yes. And then the next paragraph down, you'll see reference there to um, the cost of insurance premiums under the AMP Flexible Lifetime Super Plan were deducted taking into account your D-Link smoker status. See yes. that? And then while under the custom super plan, your D-Link smoker status for insurance was not required, as the insurance was specific to your employer, <clears throat> all employees employed by that company received the same cover. Your D-Link smoker status only became relevant when the D-Link occurred to the AMP Flexible Lifetime Super Plan and you were advised accordingly. We do not assume that you are a smoker and so the smoker status you were applied with was a standard D-Link rate, which is different to an actual smoker rate. And that's the point that you were making before? That's right. Was there an actual smoker rate? Yes, there was. There, there were three rates at this point in time? No, my apologies. There were three rates from 2006 onwards. From 2006? That's right. So that is at the date of this letter, there were three rates? There were two rates as at the date of this letter, I believe. Uh, my apologies. Is this 2013? It is. Yes, that's right. So there were three rates. That's right. And those rates were non-smoker, right. standard, and smoker. Well, non-smoker, uh, D-Link, and smoker. Non-smoker, D-Link, sorry, sm non-smoker, D-Link. So non-smoker, a D-Link category, and a smoker category. What was the difference between the D-Link and the smoker category? So in um, 2006, the D-Link category was created to separate um, the standard rate between smokers and D-Link members, which had the effect of lowering the premium for the D-Link members because the premium rates were not as significant as a smoker rate. How would AMP know if somebody's a smoker? They don't know unless they're underwritten. So in these plans, increases in cover can have uh, individual underwriting, and if there are smokers declared, then you will naturally uh, price that accordingly. So for a non-underwritten member, there were only two rates? That's right. Thank you. And was this member underwritten? No. Well, I believe the member may have been underwritten in the custom super product. Uh, and, and on D-Link actually carried through some of the arrangements associated with that underwriting. For a non-underwritten member, there were two rates? Yes. There was non-smoker and D-Link? That's right. And given that, the D-Link rate is, in effect, the smoker rate, isn't it? No, because it reflects the risks attached to factors other than just smoking. Such as? Uh, well, it could be any, any range of, of, of events. If a member is approved 
under an automatic acceptance limit, the insurer doesn't really know the health of the member, and so the experience of that fund reflects unknown medical conditions those members may have, <coughs> as well, well as smoker rates. Well, is that right? All a person needs to do to move to the non-smoker rate is to fill out a non-smoker declaration. That's right. The only differential between the non-smoker rate and the standard rate is whether or not somebody has completed that declaration. That's true. So necessarily the only difference between the two rates is the smoker status. I'm not uh, a pricing expert, but it's my understanding that the premiums are set uh, based on the past experience of the fund or the pool of risks or lives insured. And as a result, there is sufficient differentiation between the health of a non-smoker and a smoker to warrant a different premium in the event that they declare they are a non-smoker. Well, I think that that statement probably is just confirmation of the fact that the material difference between the two is whether the person is a smoker or not. On the surface, I understand the point you're making. Um, I believe that from 2006 onwards, the fact that a smoker rate was differentiated from a delinked rate, which was also differentiated from a smoker rate, is evidence that there are different risk factors at play between not just smoker and non-smoker. Well, an underwritten rate's got no relevance to somebody who's not underwritten, does it? No, it doesn't. So we can put to one side what happens to somebody who's being underwritten because an underwritten policy is necessarily bespoke in that it responds in a price sense and perhaps in a coverage sense to the particular circumstances of the particular insured. Yes, but only to the amounts above the automatic acceptance limits. Yes, but it's differential from group life on that basis. Group life is necessarily an insurance policy that covers a mass of people. Yes. And one way that AMP chose to differentiate the premiums on group life policies was if somebody was a non-smoker. That's right. And therefore, if they were not if they did not take a step to notify AMP that they were a non-smoker, then they were in effect paying a smoker rate. No, I don't agree with that statement. Do you think that you're splitting hairs? No, because the, the premium rates are set based on more events than, than, than pure smokers. Well, of course they are. All premiums for life are set on all manner of bases, but the simple point remains the only difference between paying the non-smoker rate and the other rate was whether or not you were a smoker. That's right. So nothing else matters. To get the non-smoker rate, that's true. Thank you. Do you think that it was a little cute in this letter to say that you are a, we do not assume that you are a smoker and so the smoker status you were applied with was a standard D-link rate which is different to an actual smoker rate in circumstances where there was no actual smoker rate? I think the wording could have been better. It's just wrong, isn't it? There was no actual smoker rate. No, that's true. So it's misleading the member by leading the member to believe that there was another rate that did not exist. Well, I think it's trying to, to, to outline that um, the factors that are included in the premium are matters other than just smoking. So it's seeking to, to illustrate that point, that the D-Link um, members' lives and the smoker lives are actually in a blended rate. Well, sitting there reading that sentence, we do not assume that you are a smoker, and so the smoker status you were applied with was a standard D-Link rate which is different to an actual smoker rate. Sitting there now, reading that sentence, do you think that there is any way that a member could have understood the nuance that you've just tried to attribute to that sentence? No, I think it's, it's difficult to understand for a member. Thank you. Could we move to the next page of that document, please? It says at the top, AMP was not contacted. As AMP was not contacted, the insurance cover continued and you were charged D-Link smoker premiums for this cover accordingly. I have checked our systems and can find no record of the return mail to indicate that you had not been issued with the document noted in this letter. And then there is AMP's decision, which was we will not be refunding any excess D-Link smoker premiums charged from 2 July 2005 back to your plan. Yes. See that? Commissioner, I tender that letter. Letter 15 March 
13 AMP to member concerning, quote, your inquiry, unquote, AMP 6000 exhibit 6.238. Uh, Mr Sainsbury, you're aware that sometime after receiving that letter, the member lodged a complaint with the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal? Yes, I am. Thank you. And um, if I could now show you another document, it's AMP.6000.0305. <coughs> Dot zero th one three eight. Um, this is a for for reasons I'm not sure. This comes through in exceedingly small font. But perhaps if we could start from the email at the bottom and blow that one up, the very foot of the page, starting from. Antoinette Davino. This is an internal AMP email chain, and I'll just read it up the page quickly. Um, Hi, Josh, we have another SCT matter regarding delinking and the higher premiums charged. Is that reference to the fact that there have been other matters that have gone to the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal on this issue? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not familiar with the complaints at that time, but it, it does indicate that there are, there are some consumer um, matters. This might not have been the first time this question had come up. Potentially. Thank you. That part of the email can come down now. And then if we could blow up the main email that's in blue from Miss Semon to Ms Davino. Do you know who any of these people are? You'll, see, you'll recall I asked you earlier about Miss Semon and I said, who does yes. she work for? There's a footer at the bottom there that might assist you. It doesn't assist me to understand who she works for within AMP. Uh, she works for, according to that, the, uh, the operations function, which is where administration or record keeping and customer servicing functions are performed. I know that perhaps sometimes the lines are a little blurred, but is this happening within AMP Life? This is happening as part of AMP Life's uh, administration. Of agreement. the fund? Yes. Thank you. The email, uh, the first heading is the trustee's overall position, and it says, AMP Life has investigated the complaint regarding the insurance smoker status for the member's superannuation plan and our response remains the same. This complaint was also reviewed by Risk Product in March during the complaint process and the rebate of premiums was declined. AMP Life will not be refunding the smoker premiums charged on this plan due to the fact that we have clearly explained to the client through various correspondence what would happen to his plan and the insurance features once he left his employer. This is, I just want to make sure that I properly understand this. This is AMP Life in its non-insurance capacity forming a view on behalf of the trustee about whether AMP Life as the insurer should refund premiums. Is that what's going on? I think um, there's, two, there's two elements to this. The first is uh, what you've just said is true in relation to the operations function, but it appears as though that complaint was referred to the insurer, which is defined as risk product, for 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 a consideration um, as well. So this is Miss Semon with an AMP Life as insurer hat on, is it? No, I believe this is with um, AMP Life, the administrator. The administrator. All right. So when. She says AMP Life will not be refunding the smoker premiums. She's making a decision on behalf of the insurer while acting in her capacity as administrator for the trustee? Well, it appears as though um, having had uh, feedback from the product area. From the product previously. area? Yeah. Is that your people? No. It's Who's the insurer. Oh, the insurer. Yes. Thank you. Um, 
Second paragraph, furthermore, AMP Life has consistently kept the member informed about its insurance cover by issuing annual statements that clearly show the insurance coverage attached to this plan, and the member has had multiple opportunities over the years to ask AMP Life to cancel this insurance or challenge its validity. Do you accept that that sentence has got nothing to do with the member's complaint? Uh, yes, I do, other than the opportunity for the member to challenge the premiums that, that he was paying as displayed on the statements. This complaint wasn't about the fact of insurance and whether it was valid, it was about the amount being paid for it. That's right. Then says AMP Life has a responsibility to treat all of our members fairly and we cannot make exceptions that may compromise our position with other members that may have requested the same refund due to their own negligence. Does that mean that the better position is for AMP Life to treat all members in this category unfairly? No, I don't believe that was the intent of the statement. She then says AMP Life would have honoured a claim subject to assessment had there been one made during the period and therefore our position remains that we will not be refunding the member any insurance premium fees. Again, that goes to the fact of the insurance, not to the cost of the insurance. Yes, I agree. And it certainly sounds from the language used there that the person writing this email was considering the position on behalf of AMP Life, the insurer. I can't comment whether that's true or not. All right. And then you'll see there's an extract of the complaint there uh, at the bottom and it says, complaint description note, client delinked from Custom Super in 2005, the insurance came across on smoker rates and there's nothing in this internal correspondence that seeks to suggest that statement was wrong, that the insurance came across on smoker rates. Yes, it's been very clear in the um, preparation of this uh, witness statement that there is um, a lot of inconsistent understanding of the of the premium rates that are applied and uh, labels that are attached to things that in fact have not proved to be true. Thank you. Um, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Internal AMP emails concerning SCT complaint September th uh, 2013, AMP 6000 exhibit 6.239. Could I take you now please to AMP.6000.0305.026 This is correspondence from <coughs> AMP to the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal about the member's complaint to that tribunal. Yes. You've seen this. Um, and if we could please move to, um, perhaps if we could put 0269 and 0270 on the screen together. <coughs> this is AMP uh, setting out its position the foot of the first page, the trustee is satisfied that the member received adequate disclosure to enable him to understand that higher premiums would apply upon transfer to FLS, that's Flexible Lifetime Super. That's right. And that he needed to complete an on-smokers declaration to have his premium adjusted to a reduced rate. Now, just pausing there, there was one occasion when he could have done that, and that was upon the dealing happening. That's right, on the welcome letter. Thank you. And then it says, it's not the trustee's practice to treat members as smokers by default. Have you now accepted that that is inaccurate? No, I haven't. All right. At the time they are transferred from an employer-sponsored plan, AMP does not know the member's smoking habits, and therefore the members are charged a standard insurance premium rate. Members are then offered a reduced premium if they complete a declaration that they are non-smokers, but this is only possible after the member informs AMP that they are a non-smoker. Uh, the trustee maintains that it has acted fairly and reasonably in declining to refund the difference in standard and non-smoker rates back to, to the transfer to FLS. So that was the position. 
And I thought that you and I had got to the point where you acknowledged that for all intents and purposes, there was a non-smoker rate and a smoker rate. No, I believe I said that there was a non-smoker rate and a hybrid rate. And the only difference between the two was whether or not somebody completed a non-smoker declaration? That's right. And in those circumstances, there was a non-smoker rate and there was a smoker rate. And it does, it's not just for smokers. It's for other lives that are insured as well, well who I are non-smokers. Well, can we agree on this? The only point of distinction between the two rates is whether the member has submitted a non-smoking declaration. That's true. And it is the case... So whether you call it a hybrid rate or another rate or a different rate, the only point of difference is whether the member has submitted a non-smoker declaration. Is that, that is that right? true. Yes. And the next, thank you, Commissioner. The next point is that absent the declaration, the person is defaulted to the other rate. That's right. Thank you. Commissioner, I tender that document. Letter AMP to Superannuation Complaints Tribunal, 17 October 13, <coughs> AMP 6000. 03050268, exhibit 6.240. I should correct the uh, uh, designation of that exhibit. It will be letter AMP trustee services to superannuation complaints tribunal, 17 October 13. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Sainsbury, I'd now take you to another document, AMP.6000.0305. Dot zero two seven three. Uh, this is a letter. It's dated on the second page, the thirtieth of January, twenty fourteen, from the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal back to AMP. Yes. And if I could take you, please, to. Uh, 0276 of that document. The letter attaches a whole range of documents. Um, this is a document where the member is making the complaint to the tribunal and you can see in bold at the foot <coughs> an increased cost to my AMP super fund of $66,000 over the period. I've not only been overcharged an estimated $66,429.02 by AMP, but also have incurred loss of earnings inside my super fund on the overcharged amount over the period. I was purportedly sent only one letter back on the 22nd of January 2005 informing me of the non-smoker statement to an address which I never requested, as I have all mail go to a PO box. And then if we go over the page, a reasonable man would expect to receive more than one notice regarding such a large amount of money, and this disclosure could have easily been made on subsequent annual statements for this issue to have been resolved years ago. Do you accept that? Yes, I do. Thank you. Tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, Superannuation Complaints Tribunal Notice of Conciliation Conference, 30 January 2014, AMP 6003050273, Exhibit 6.241. I showed you there the member had estimated about $66,000 in increased premiums paid. Yes. AMP did its own calculation. I'll take you to that document, AMP.6000. Dot zero three zero five dot zero seven two four. This is a calculation <clears throat> produced by AMP in answer to a request from the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal who wanted to ascertain what the true figure was. And you can see there the premium difference between the actual premiums paid and the premiums that would have applied on the non-smoker rate was $76,766.58. Yes. Thank you. Tender that document, Commissioner. 
AMP premium comparison calculation, 6 June 2014, AMP 6003050724, exhibit 6.242. <coughs> Could I now please take you to AMP.6000.0305.0724, it's another letter from AMP to the Tribunal, you see under the heading Members Complaint, the member was transferred to a personal FLS account upon leaving his employer plan in AMP Custom Super and the premiums deducted for his EDB insurance. What's EDB? I think it stands for extra death benefit. Thank you. Were deducted at smoker rates. See that? Yes, that goes to my comment earlier about the inconsistent understanding inside AMP. Not everyone's got quite the nuanced understanding of the difference between the two rates that you have. Uh, there are a number of people that do, but there are some that don't. Some view a rate where the only difference in the premium being charged is whether the person's a smoker or not as being a smoker rate as opposed to a non-smoker rate. Well, I've, I've been through my point about hybrid rates before. The resolution the member seeks is for the refund of additional premiums he was charged because he was classified as a smoker. This is a letter from a senior trustee officer. Yes. Then if we go over the page to 0743, <clears throat> there's a heading trustee's decision and it sets out there the determinations the trustee made in coming to um, a decision not to refund the premiums. And then over the page at 0744, paragraph 8, your point's again made. It's not the trustee's practice to treat members as smokers by default at the time they're transferred. AMP doesn't know their habits and they're charged the standard rate and they're offered a reduced discount if they're non-smokers. That's your point? Yes. And then over the page to paragraph 9, AMP addresses the criticism that it didn't include the smoker status in the annual statements and says it didn't include them because it wasn't required to under section 1017D of the Corporations Act. See that? Yes. But I think you've now said there's been a change of position and you now do include, is that right? In 2013, um there was an enhancement to the statements to indicate whether the smoker status was known by the member. Thank you. Commissioner, I tender that document. Uh, letter AMP to uh, uh, Superannuation Complaints Tribunal, 29 January 15, AMP 6003050742, Exhibit 6.243. Just before that document comes down, uh, at line uh, six of the uh, page that we presently see on the screen, there is reference to whether there is an additional loading on the premium, and that statement is made in connection with section 1017D of the uh, Corporations Act. Is that an expression that uh, derives from the Corporations Act? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not certain, Commissioner. Is it right to describe what you refer to as the hybrid rate, but might be referred to as the non-smoking non rate, uh, is a rate that had an additional loading on the premium? No, I don't believe so. I believe the premiums were calculated based on the experience of the lives in that risk pool. Well, that would be an unusual... Uh, calculation of premium if it were not founded on uh, some actuarial assessment, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, it would be based on actuarial assessment. And uh, the premium charged 
uh, was higher than uh, the premium charged to a person who had made a non-smoking declaration. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Yes, do go on. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, could I take you now to RCD.0021.0022.0001? This is, the this is the determination of the superannuation complaints tribunal in respect of this matter. And you see there that it recites some of the uh, facts for the decision under review. If we could go to double zero, oh, sorry, triple zero seven of that document. See at paragraph 38, the tribunal says, what is clear, however, and the tribunal finds accordingly is that after June 2005, the trustee did not send any communication to the complainant, bringing to his attention that he was paying significantly, <coughs> significantly larger insurance premiums than would be the case if he was a non-smoker and if he provided a declaration to the trustee to that effect. And you've agreed with me previously that that was the case. That's right. Do you think that irrespective of any debate about whether or not the non-smoker rate and the, the standard rate, sorry, whether the standard rate is in effect a smoker rate, irrespective of that debate, do you think that in forming a decision about how to treat this complaint, it was relevant to the, that the trustee had failed to tell the member more than once that there was an additional premium being charged because of the absence of the no smoker declaration? Um, well, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't um, in the trustee, and I'm not the trustee, and I wasn't there at that time, but I, I believe that um, the trustee was of the view that they were entitled to rely on uh, the communication that was sent to the member. Uh, I think by today's standards, um, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, you would certainly uh, outline more frequently than was the case the circumstances for an individual member with regards to large insurance premiums. It's not very member-centric to say that eight years ago we sent you a letter and we've charged you a higher, higher premium every year since then without telling you again, is it? Uh, it could be better. If that paragraph could come down, and you can see there at 41, the tribunal addresses the 1017D point and says the tribunal acknowledges that the section did not specifically require that details be provided in annual statements, that the insurance premium would be cheaper if non-smoker rates applied, but the section required that the annual statement must give the member information that the trustee reasonably believed the member would need to understand his or her investment in the fund, higher premiums that were debited to the complainant's account reduced his benefit in the fund. That was how the tribunal saw that part of AMP's <coughs> argument. Yes. If we go over the page to 0008, paragraph 46, consequently the tribunal's view is that it was not fair and reasonable for the trustee to refuse to refund to the complainant's account in the fund the premiums that were debited to his account which exceeded those that would have applied if the complainant had provided a non-smoking declaration to the trustee. Yes. And then over the page to 0009, paragraph 52, the tribunal requires that AMP refund the additional premiums and says that interest should be added at the earning rates that have been credited to the complainant's benefit in the fund from the dates on which the excess premiums were deducted from his account. So this complaint was upheld and yes, the member was. received back the differential premiums together with the interests that had been lost on the use of that money. That's right. And what happened after that? Did AMP pay those amounts to the member's fund? Uh, I, believe, I believe that would be the case, but I, I can't confirm. Does AMP accept that it failed to act fairly and reasonably by charging higher premiums every year after 2005 to this particular member? I think um, AMP would, would have the view that it, it could have improved its disclosure to members, um, but that it did provide the opportunity for a non-smoker declaration to be provided uh, to the member um, at the appropriate point. Well, let me 
put it to you again in slightly different terms. Does AMP accept that by failing to communicate to the member that a higher premium rate was being charged because no non-smoking declaration had been received every year after 2005, that it failed to act fairly and reasonably? Um, no, I don't, I don't think it was whether it acted fairly or reasonably because I think it was entitled to rely on the communication to the member uh, at the time of delinking. But I do accept that the disclosures could have been better with the benefit of hindsight. So your view and AMP's view is that the superannuation complaints tribunal was wrong in finding that AMP had not acted fairly and reasonably? Well, the, um, the trustee, as you're aware, has uh, disputed the, the claim from the member as part of the submission to the SCT. And part of the basis upon which they did that was that there have been previous determinations from the SCT finding that, that uh, multiple communications are not required to members. And it was on that basis that the trustee formed that view, I believe. Yes. Um, but that view was proved incorrect by the reasons that I've just taken you to. Can you explain? I've just shown you a paragraph in the trustee's re uh, sorry in the tribunal's reasons where it said that the trustee failed to act fairly and reasonably. Yes, I understand. In respect of this member. Yes. Do you accept that AMP failed to act fairly and reasonably in respect of this member? Yes, I do. Is there any reason why this member would be in a different position from anybody else who had been sent one letter about the non-smoking issue? and then continued to be charged premiums after it? Conceptually, no difference. Thank you. Does AMP accept that for the same reasons it failed to act in this member's best interests by continuing to charge the higher premiums? Uh, yes, I think it's, I think it's um, appropriate that, that, um, that the trustee could have communicated more effectively. Does AMP accept that it failed to handle the member's complaint fairly and reasonably? Uh, no, I don't believe that's the case. Thank you. Um, is it appropriate for a trustee to presume that a member may be a smoker absent a non-smoking declaration? That is a fairly standard principle attached to the issue of automatic acceptance um, in group life policies. That, that you accept those lives on the basis of very limit, limited information. Uh, so I think it's reasonable to accept. Are you familiar with ASIC's Report 529? I Member am. experiences in superannuation? Yes, I am. Um, are you aware that ASIC had something to say about smoker defaults in that report? Yes, I am. Um, can I take you please to RCD. This is Exhibit 6.228, RCD.0025. Dot triple zero three dot zero double three four. As well, that's coming up the ACT determination of complaint six you. May fifteen RCD double zero two one double zero two two triple zero one is exhibit six point two four four. This is the report, and you're familiar with it, I think you said? I am, yeah. Thank you. If we could move to 0352, please. And if paragraph 82 could be popped out. ASIC's view is that trustees should not presume that members smoke in determining their insurance premiums. There are low levels of smoking in the community with only 14.5% of adults being daily smokers. In these circumstances, it is statistically appropriate to assume a person is not a smoker in the absence of other information about that member or that group of members. Does AMP accept that? Uh, I can't comment on whether I think that's appropriate from a risk pricing point of view or not. Is that because only 
the insurer could comment on that? I believe so. Wouldn't the trustee have a view about whether or not its members should be charged higher premiums based on a circumstance that only applies to 14.5 per cent of adults being daily smokers? Well, I think the trustee um, would have a view that they need to rely on insurers uh, to take into account the risk factors in setting the price for that insurance. Well, in a negotiation over a group life policy, you have on one side of the table a trustee who is presumably trying to obtain greatest coverage for cheapest price. That's right. And you have an insurer on the other side who's looking to make sure that they do a deal that is risk and price appropriate. That's right. And insofar as the trustee is concerned, the central question is, is the coverage appropriate for the members? Yes. And is it appropriately priced? Yes. And where there is a price effect because of a presumption that is statistically inappropriate, surely the trustee would have an issue with that? If, if they were defaulted to a smoker rate per se, yes, I, I would agree. But ASIC say it should be to the contrary. They should be defaulted to a non-smoker rate. Well, I, I imagine, I'm not an insurer again, and it's not my role to talk about, about the insurer themselves, but I, I imagine that in doing so, the insurer would need to accommodate the fact that there are smokers in any risk pool. Mr Sainsbury, is part of the problem here that AMP views these questions from the perspective of the insurer and not the perspective of the members who are paying for the insurance? Well, I was just trying to explain uh, the difference between the insurer's view and the trustee's view. But I have asked you a question twice now expressly about the perspective of a trustee who is presumably advocating on the behalf of the members, and on both occasions you have answered by reference to a consideration relevant only to the insurer. Well, all I'm saying to you is I believe the, the, the trustee is looking to get the best outcome for its members, and so to the degree that you're suggesting that um, smokers should be excluded on the basis, that would be a trustee view that they would endorse, I imagine. I want to make sure I understand it. Is AMP trustee's position that ASIC's right in paragraph 82 of this report? I don't know the view of the trustee on that. Who matter. would know the view? Uh, the trustee board. Are you aware of whether the trustee board's considered this? I don't know whether they've considered it. Should they have? Uh, yes, I think they should have seen the, uh, the ASIC report. This report was issued in June 2017? That's right. Are you aware of any step being taken by the trustees in connection with paragraph 82 of the report? No, I'm not. Thank you. I want to move to a different topic now, Mr Sainsbury. That document can come down, thank you. In April of this year, someone within AMP Life identified that premiums were still being deducted from the accounts of deceased AMP superannuation members. That's right. Familiar with that? Yes, I am. And following that identification, an investigation was commenced? When did that investigation commence? It commenced in April of this year. The investigation identified a number of system errors, and those errors alone or in combination meant that in some cases AMP did not stop deducting premiums for members account from members' accounts, and in other cases did not process premium refunds owed to deceased members. That's right. And these were premiums for life insurance? Uh, that's right. Where there was no longer a life to insure? That's right. <coughs> and on the 12th of June, the matter was reported to the Insurance and Wealth Solutions Incident Working Group? Yes. Where within AMP does that working group sit? It uh, is coordinated by the Enterprise Risk Management Function. Is that AMP Life or AMP Super or another entity? Uh, it's another entity. Which entity? Uh, well, it's the AMP group, and it provides support services to the, to the various legal entities such as AMP Life. Thank you. The working group meets weekly? Yes. Well, as required, but, but generally weekly. Thank you. Um, 
the incident was identified in April, why did it take until June before the matter was reported to the working group? So um, there's uh, quite a lot of history uh, in this particular matter in the sense that it's quite complex and it goes back uh, a number of years. And in order to quantify uh, the size and the extent of the issue, it was necessary to do uh, a fair bit of investigation. And that investigation takes time. The committee discussed the matter on the 20th of June, 2018? Yes. And at that meeting, the committee determined to report the incident to APRA and to ASIC? Yes. And the matter was reported to APRA and ASIC as a breach on the 26th of June? That's right. Why did it take six days after the meeting for the regulators to be notified? Well, that's within the normal reporting timelines for, for the organisation. Thank uh, you. Letters need to be drafted, approved, reviewed. Um, I'll take you to that notification. You've exhibited exhibited it as LGR 3 to your witness statement in answer to <coughs> rubric 669. It's amp.6000.0281.0046. This is the breach report and it's addressed to APRA and to ASIC. And the issue is explained there. Um, ASL is AMP Superannuation Limited. That's right. As the issuer of superannuation products and AMPL, which is AMP Life. Yes. As the administrator of the superannuation products, including the administration of life insurance at a member level, and AMP Life as the insurer have identified instances where insurance premiums charged to the member's superannuation account after the member's death were either not refunded or the amount of the refund was not correct. That's right. Has AMP encountered this problem with any other group life insurer? No, it hasn't. Only AMP life? That's right. Thank you. Well, sorry, I might qualify. Uh, where the group scheme is administered on AMP's record keeping systems, there would be a possibility that, that other group life providers won't have had the re their premiums refunded in the same way because the, the administration of the premiums is deducted from that administration system. Is that something AMP's inquired into? Yes, it is. And has it ascertained any other insurers where this has happened? I, I believe there are other insurers uh, in our latest investigation. That's the opposite answer to the answer yes. you initially gave? Yes, it is. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next paragraph says, the issue impacts members with retail and corporate superannuation products issued by AMP Super who are covered by an insurance policy issued by AMP Life as the insurer. Yes. And the investigation has so far identified 3,124 members with a total of $922,902 in premium refunds owing. That's right. And then under that, AMP are currently investigating if other fee types were deducted in error and will notify ASIC of the outcome of this investigation. Yes. And what has that investigation identified? Uh, well, it's still ongoing, um, but it, it does appear as though there are other fee types that have been deducted post the date of death that will need to be refunded as well. All right. And it was April of this year that that issue was first identified? That's right. Can I take you please to AMP.6000.0302.0046? <coughs> This is another one of those very small emails. Perhaps if the last part of the chain could be blown up first. This is an email chain from April of this year, um, which I think is discussing the issue that's been identified and is the subject of the breach report. Yes, it is. Um, and you'll see it's an email from Natalie Tumor. Head of Claims, Life, Fast Track and Administration. And she says, before raising this risk incident with Fortin, 
can you email me a summary of what this entails and also your concerns, including what you believe is the correct practice and why? Also, if you have any numbers in terms of current claim volumes, that would be great. Before raising this with anyone outside of our claims team, we will need to make Jen, Mi make Jen Mitchell is aware. Who's Jen Mitchell? Uh, Jen Mitchell was the head of the claims unit. Was? Yes. Thank you. Uh, is aware of it and ask for her direction on next steps. Due to the sensitivity of what is going on at the moment, it's best we raise this matter with her in the first instance. See that? Yes, I do. And then if we go to the next part of the email chain, it's a response from Luke Wilson. And it says, hi Nat, okay, no problem. I'll try and get some numbers together based on the current portfolio. This has been going on well before I started in the team, so I'm not sure if we are waiting a number from the last 12 months or just on the current open book. Let me know and I'll try to get something together early next week. When he says this has been going on well before I started in the team, he doesn't mean the investigation, does he? No, I, I'm not sure. I believe the, the, the issue is the problem has been going on for well past Thank you. months. And then if we go to the top of the page, there's another email from Mr. Wilson to Ms. Tumuth. He describes the issue in the, sec uh, the second paragraph after the bullet points. The issue is that Corp, who's Corp? Uh, I imagine it'll be corporate superannuation. Thank you. Continue to charge premiums for the insurance even after AMP has been notified of the members passing. Yes. We have raised this with Corp in the past and asked them why they continue to charge the insurance premiums once they are notified of a customer's death back in 2016. I believe that they were of the understanding the premiums are refunded when the policy is paid, which is correct. Which is incorrect. Which, which is incorrect. Mm. <laughs> Do you still say that this issue was identified in April 2018? Yes. Yeah, this, this matter um, that they're talking about here was a concern that was raised in 2016 by, um, by someone in the corporate super team uh, saying or asking the question, was it appropriate that we continued to deduct life insurance premiums even though once the claim was admitted, those premiums were refunded by the system back to the date of death? Uh, that was raised through a number of people and then subsequently tested that in <coughs> fact the system was performing appropriately albeit it appeared from that email exchange that there was some view that um, there was in fact a better way to do it, which would be to stop the premiums on notification of death rather than refund them once the claim has been admitted. Stopping the premiums being charged when you're notified that the person's dead seems a rather obvious step, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But it wasn't taken in 2016? No, the system uh, was coded to refund it when the claim was admitted. Why was that? I, I couldn't tell you. It's it doesn't make sense, does it? No, it's not the best way, in my opinion, and it's not the way other products in that system perform. So, I'll tender that document, <coughs> Commissioner. Emails concerning corporate super still deducting premiums until a claim is paid, April 2018, AMP 6000 0302 0005, Exhibit 6.245. Could we now please have AMP.6000.0302.0005 and could the uh, email in the middle which includes the highlighted paragraph please be popped out? Actually before, before that's popped out could we please go to the next page which is 0007. And if 0008 could be brought up next to it, and the email chain not including the large table that's at the foot of 0007 and the top of 0008 could be popped out, but not the big table.
Thank you. So this email chain commences. Um, I've discussed this with Georgia, and she request, requested that I refer this to you, as you are currently working on a project for this. But I have the below Corp Super Plan, where the client passed away on a date, and we were notified on the 24th of February that premiums are still being deducted from the plan. This is an email from June 2016. Yes. Um, so notwithstanding notification on the 24th of February 2015, the premiums are still coming out in June of 2016. And then there's a request, can, some, can you please have a look at this and reverse the premiums that were charged? This is an example of the issue that is ultimately reported to ASIC. Uh, no, I believe this is the issue that I described earlier, which is the system is not um, is, is treating the refund of premiums at a different time to the date of death. Well, premiums are still being deducted from this plan. This says you were no AMP was notified on the twenty fourth of February twenty fifteen, but premiums are still being deducted from the plan. Yes, I, I can only assume the claim wasn't admitted at that time. It's a process, as I described, um, uh, of refund occurs automatically by the system when the claim is actually finalised. Well, refund of what's deducted, refund of what's deducted plus the earnings it would have earned, refund of what? Uh, Commissioner, I believe it's the refund of the premiums, but I... I'm so not the time sure. value of money goes to AMP's benefit? Potentially. Charging premiums for life insurance to someone who's dead. That's the position, isn't it? Yes, that's, that's the way the system is treating it today, for a portion of our business. And Mr Sainsbury, this is the issue that was reported to ASIC on the 26th of June, isn't it? In the notif breach notification, which I've already taken you to, AMP notes, in, notes instances where insurance premiums charged the member's superannuation account after the member's death. I'd need to see the full email trial yes. uh, to, to, to be able to work out where this fits. All right, well, I'll take you up. But this, is how, this is how it begins. Yes. Somebody notifies that AMP's been aware for about 18 months that the member is no longer alive, but the premiums for life insurance are still being deducted. And if that part of the document could come down, please. Would you like the opportunity just to read this email before I take you to the next part I want to take you to? Yes, that'd be um, Perhaps if 0007 could be put on the screen and made a little larger so that Mr Sainsbury has a fighting chance of reading it. Perhaps if the bottom half could be enlarged for now and then Mr Sainsbury, when you are ready to read the next Thank upper you. part of the document, you can let us know. So I'm ready to see the... Thank you. If we could go to the top half of that page. Is that the end? No, if right. I could now move to 0006. And perhaps do the same thing with the bottom half of the page. You tell me when you've read that, Mr Sainsbury, because I've got some questions for you about this part of the email.
Yes. You see there, um, <clears throat> in the top part of the email, uh, Georgina Gabbery writes, I cannot understand why the premiums continue to come out once we have been notified of a claim. This has caused the following issues. Complaints, policies to be closed due to lack of funds as premiums are continually being taken out. We email the trustee about corporate plans not ceasing premiums at time of notification and ask if there is anything in the trust deed. You see that? Yes, I do. So it seems that there have been complaints to AMP about this issue before? It appears that way, yeah. Thank you. And then if we go up the page, <coughs> the very first li line there, hi Jen and Nat. This is from Mr Wilson who was emailing before about the April 2018 investigation. This is the email where the issue was raised in 2016 regarding <coughs> premiums being debited on corporate policies. Yes. Yeah. Neither APRA nor ASIC were told that AMP was aware of this issue in 2016, were they? No, they weren't. Why? Well, it wasn't considered to be the same issue. But you've just agreed with me it is. Well, what of what of just maybe a moment. Pardon? Well, I thought there was about to be an objection. There's not. Put the question again. I thought that you had agreed with me that this was the same issue identified in the breach notice, that is, fees being charged by AMP for insurance after it's been notified of the fact that a person is dead. I object to that question. Yeah, why? Uh, the breach notice, um, the breach notice, um, in terms of words, uh, where insurance premiums charged in the superannuation account after the dentist's death were either not refunded or the amount of the refund was not correct. That was the issue that was the subject of the breach notice. Yes, well, Mr Costello, do you Thank want to you. rephrase Commissioner? the question? Sure. The issue that was identified in April 2018 was that life insurance premiums had been deducted from the accounts of AMP superannuation members after they were dead and not refunded. Is that right? That's right. That's as you understand it. And is the only relevance of the breach notification the additional words that the amounts had not been refunded? Well, the breach in, in uh, this year was because the amounts entitled to the member or to the estate were not, were not refunded, <coughs> whereas the issue in 2016 was not that they weren't refunded, it was just that they were refunded at a different time and we should have stopped deducting them on, death of, on notification of death. Is it your understanding that AMP has a continuing entitlement to charge premiums for life insurance to a person who's dead? No, that's not our practice. Not our policy. Practice, I should say it's part. not our policy. And there are, there are a number of examples of where the refunds have been processed appropriately because it wasn't just a system uh, issue we had. We also had process breakdowns. To your well. mind, would it be a breach of an obligation if AMP were to, duct, to continue ducting, deducting life insurance premiums to a member who had died? Yes. And that was identified as happening in 2016 Yes, it was. And was not breach reported? No, it wasn't. And as Mr Hollow has just pointed out, has still not been breach reported? Not that particular right. issue. Thank you. What does it say about AMP systems that the issue we've just been discussing was identified in 2016, but an investigation was only launched in April 2018. The, the, um, the relationship between the 2016 event and the 2018 event are not the same <coughs> matter. Why was the investigation commenced in April 2018? Uh, it was because um, as a result of the uh, uh, Commonwealth Bank's uh, circumstances around premiums on, on, um, on deceased members, uh, a question was asked inside AMP, could this happen to us? And that gave rise to uh, a, um, a review which identified the issues that were the subject of the, of the breach report. Is that as a consequence of the cross-examination of Commonwealth Bank employees at the Royal Commission? Uh, yes. Thank you. 
At the time of your statement, AMP had identified that 4,645 customers had had premiums deducted and not refunded after the member passed away? Yes. And that amounted to about $1.3 million in premium refunds? As the latest information we had, yes. Does the $1.3 million include interest or is it uh, only the amount of the premiums? I believe that amount uh, calculated included lost earnings. Included lost earnings? I believe so. Thank you. Do you accept that AMP's conduct in respect of the charging of premiums for group life insurance where the member has passed away is conduct falling below community standards and expectations? Yes. Do you accept that AMP has not acted efficiently, honestly and fairly by continuing to charge premiums in those circumstances? I accept that it has occurred, but it's not our, it's not our stated practice. My question is it charged was for something it's not entitled to charge? Yes, it has. Do you accept that at least one cause of the conduct was AMP's control systems? Yes. Thank you. I just want to briefly touch on one last issue, if I may. Commissioner, I'm not sure that I tendered that last document. No, AMP emails April and July 16. Um, AMP 600302, 006, Exhibit 6.246. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr Sainsbury, on the 6th of December last year, AMP's then CEO received a complaint in relation to group life insurance. Yes. Are you familiar with what I'm speaking of? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, could I take you please to AMP.6000.0287.0182. This is the complaint that was written to Mr Meller. You've seen this document before? Yes, I have. Um, I don't want to read the whole of the letter, but um, let me put a summary of it to you and you can tell me if you agree with it. It's a letter written by the wife of an AMP member. The AMP member has been diagnosed with a very serious medical condition. The, and the member has become aware that there is no insurance attached to the superannuation account. That's right. And... Um, the letter states that the member is in a my super option. Yes. And that the understanding of the member's wife was that my super options had to have insurance attached to them. Yes. Um, and it then states, you would imagine out of stress and horror to be informed today that this is not the case, that is that there is no insurance and that you have not provided any default minimum insurance through your my super superannuation offering as required by the legislation. And there's then a paragraph about an AMP financial planner being assigned um, and dissatisfaction with the fact that fees have been coming out of the superannuation account on that basis. And there are some questions then put to Mr Miller about how this could happen. Yes. Mr Miller, you're familiar with all of that? Yes. I'll tender that document, Commissioner. Letter to Mr Miller, CEO, AMP, 6 December 17, AMP 6002870182, Exhibit 6.247. Mr Miller referred the matter to the Office of the AMP Customer Advocate. Yes. What's the role of that office? Uh, the role of the Customer Advocate is to provide a, a, a final review um, to ensure that, that members interests have been looked after in circumstances where the member or the complainant is not happy with the normal complaint resolution processes in AMP. And is that role independent of the business? Yes, it is. And does the role have any powers itself or does it only make recommendations? Uh, it it uh, has powers as well. Thank you. The customer advocate's office formed an initial view within about two days and that's set out in an uh, email AMP.6000.0287.0182. Do 
before I take you to that email, is this a delinked member? Uh, yes, this was a delinked member. And what has happened here is that, for whatever reason, the employer had alternative superannuation arrangements, uh, sorry, alternative insurance arrangements for its employees. That's right. Um, so there wasn't insurance attached to the AMP superannuation through the employer. That's right. And on the delinking, no insurance was picked up. That's right. Notwithstanding that the person was in a MySuper product. Uh, they weren't in a MySuper product when they delinked. Thank you. Um, notwithstanding that they came to be in a MySuper product. That's right. Thank you. Um, could we now please go... Oh, thank you. Um, this is an email from somebody within the Office of Customer Advocate to Melanie Howard MacDonald, who, as I understand it, is the customer advocate. That's right. Thank you. Um, and she says, overall, I think there have been a number of occasions where AMP has not been entirely clear. You will see the important points column that AMP has various approaches to how it refers to insurance in the annual member statements. What I will need to confirm, the starting point is a copy of the member guide as that is where the benefits of being Category 1 are set out. In his first annual statement, there was a statement that you may be eligible to... Sorry, you may be able to apply for additional insurance, which suggests that he did actually have some insurance to begin with, but then goes on to state that if he dies, AMP will only pay the account value at the time. Yes. Do you accept that at the time the letter went to Mr Meller that the person was in a MySuper product? Yes, I do. And you no doubt accept that there is a statutory requirement for insurance to attach to all my super products? Yes, except for circumstances where the trustee uh, determines that it's not appropriate. Thank you. And had any such determination been made in the circumstances of this particular case? Yes, I believe uh, the member was considered to be in a category um, that, that meant that the, uh, he wasn't offered insurance as part of the my super. Conversion. Was that a mistake? I don't believe so. You think that this person, notwithstanding that he was in a MySuper product, ought not have had insurance attached to his superannuation fund? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the, the, as part of the implementation process, the trustees were presented with um, a series of circumstances where it may not be appropriate to provide default insurance to the members. They were generally designed to avoid someone paying for something that they couldn't subsequently claim on, or circumstances uh, where they may have had alternate insurance arrangements in place, and as a result, um, may have paid again for insurance that they, they couldn't or, or wouldn't use. Did the customer advocate agree with that view? No, the customer advocate, when the review was undertook, took the view that it was an administrative error that he wasn't offered the insurance at the time. Do you accept that? Uh, with the benefit of subsequent investigation and going back to the project files, uh, the trustee remains of the view uh, that the decision was appropriate. So the trustee disagrees with the customer advocate's view that's in this case? That's right. Thank you. And what, what is the basis of the trustee's view that it was appropriate? Uh, on the basis that uh, the member had, had opted out of insurance and as a result uh, of that, um, uh, wouldn't be offered insurance as part of the condition. How had the member opted out? So, um, as part of the employer scheme, the employer had arranged the insurance. When the member was delinked to FLS, there was a welcome call uh, made to him which talked about him not having insurance cover in place, and that was deemed to be the opt out. Thank you. This uh, complaint led to an investigation within AMP about whether or not people upon delinking were being provided with the insurance required? That's right. And um, what was the result of that investigation? So the investigation uh, is not complete, but uh, our current position and our latest engagement with the regulator is, is that we do not believe this to be a breach. I will, I will say for the member um, that uh, the custom advocates investigation uh, was done in a very short period of time and in very difficult circumstances for the client. And as a result of that, the group believes the outcome that was uh, delivered for the, for the client or the member and his family was, was a very good outcome in the context of uh, granting default cover 
and also uh, granting an ex gratia payment for the amount of insurance uh, when he rolled in other superannuation into AMP. You think it was a very good outcome? Yes, I do. But you don't think it was the right outcome? So, um, for the circumstances at the time, considering um, the individual matter, uh, AMP is 100% behind the outcome for that member. But might not be for a member in a similar position? Well, um, the trustees' view is the, the reasons why they, they settled on those exclusions are still appropriate. You said that you formed the view it wasn't a breach. Yes. Um, but AMP issued a possible breach notification to APRA and ASIC about this issue, didn't it? Yes, we did. On the 4th of June 2018? Yes. And are you aware that APRA rejected that letter and invited a proper notification? Yes, I am. On the basis that it wasn't interested in a proper... Oh, sorry, on a possible breach, it wanted to know what AMP's view was, in fact. And that resulted in a formal breach notification right. being lodged. And was that in error? Is that your evidence? Uh, it, was, it was lodged uh, with our best information at the time, um, without the investigation being complete. Uh, and the subsequent investigation has yielded uh, a better understanding of the circumstances around the decisions taken back in 2014. Has AMP identified how many people have delinked from an employer plan and do not have insurance? As part of the uh, investigation, the total number of members that did not receive insurance under the My Super Defaults has been quantified, and each person that delinked because they didn't have insurance arrangements in place is understood. Is understood. Yes. Um, I might just briefly take you to the. Um, to a letter that you wrote to APRA and to ASIC. It's AMP.6000.0288.0000. This is an update on the breach notification that had already been sent. Yes. And if we go to the second page, 1332, the investigation's findings, it says, upon investigating the 1,600 members initially identified high-level analysis and sample testing was conducted, which demonstrated that members were not provided default insurance due to conditions set by AMP in offering default insurance. Yes. Such as evidence of previously cancelled insurance or low balances. Yes. Is that, does that statement mean that AMP has satisfied itself in respect of each of the 1,600 members that it is appropriate that they not have insurance? Uh, AMP is in the process of establishing itself, uh, establishing that fact. Thank you. Has there been any remediation beyond the particular member that we were discussing earlier? I don't believe there are any other circumstances that we're aware of that's, that, that, that would require remediation. And save for the fact of this particular member's complaint, is it right that this issue wouldn't have been investigated by AMP? Uh, I, I believe that um, the, the members that, that were actually excluded were, were done so with the business rules that were approved by the trustee at the time. So apart from this one member raising an issue and being investigated, uh, there would be no cause for action on the other members. But you only know that because of the investigation, don't you? I, I, well, I know it because the, those members have actually been excluded as specific criteria. You know that because of the investigation? No. Well, yes, because of uh, once the breach lodge, the breach was lodged, um, uh, that caused the investigation to go back to the original project documentation. Yes. Which gave rise to the categories that wouldn't be offered insurance. Yes. So this yeah. particular complaint has caused you to have the review that you had. Yes. And you've satisfied yourself as a consequence of the review. We're in the process of satisfying ourselves. How much longer will it take before you have a concluded view on the 1,600 members you've identified? Uh, I would think. Uh, potentially a month or two longer. Commissioner, I tender that document. Yes, the previous email I think also needs to be tendered, doesn't it? That's the email of 8 December 17. Uh, yes, thank you, Commissioner. Customer Advocate AMP 6000-0287-0165 becomes Exhibit 6.248. The letter then, AMP to APRA dated. Uh,
the it's August, it's the 10th of August. Thank you. 10 August 18, AMP 6000 0288133 exhibit 6.249. I have no further questions, Commissioner. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Hollow. I have nothing in re-examination, Mr. Commissioner. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, then you may step down, Mr. Hansbury. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Costello. Commissioner, that ends the group life part of the module and, in fact, the life insurance part of the module. If we could adjourn briefly to reconstitute. Uh, if I come back, what, at 10 to? Thank you, Commissioner. Yes.